language that the words that is used in Genesis for God is Elohim, which is a plural. It's both masculine and feminine. It's the equivalent to the word they when you use the word Elohim. So it's the gods, and it means both either masculine or feminine. It hasn't got as um, a gender. So I it's an interesting word to use for God. E, uh, well, I can only express it, express it in English. It's E L O H I M. E L O H I M. Yeah. Would that be in an English dictionary? It's in Strong's. It's in Strong's Concordance, mm -hmm. okay. so we can give you the root for that. It's a strange word to use, but um, considering the way it's normally translated as he, but um, yeah, so it. Please accept that as uh, an inclusive thing there, that when we're talking about land, we're talking about the, the genus, if you like. So, um, that man is actually the representation of God in earth. We're made in the image of God, which the audience would certainly have taken literally in, uh, in the 16th century. That's what they would have been taught from the pulpit. That's what they would have been taught in school. So in terms of that representation, it's only right that they should see the body of the king to be representational of the most perfect person about. Now we've learned from the realm that the realm, the people, if you like, would want from a king someone who represents God on earth and is able to rule them. Now in this part, we're moving up towards talking about the type of person that would take control. You know, the type of... <coughs> leadership that was wanted and the depth of character that was, would have been wanted inside that personage that was going to take the throne, was going to te be, become the king. Right. The first real reference that we're given is Measure for Measure, which is a fascinating story for those of you who know. The Duke in Measure for Measure decides to, because the people have become slack, his rule has become loosened, and they're becoming a little bit um, ungovernable. He decides to take a trip, to tell everybody he's taking a trip, sorry, and to abdicate the, the throne, the, the, the dukedom of this Italian state, and, um, sorry, it's Austria, this Austrian state, and move back into his own kingdom, to come back into his kingdom as a friar in disguise and give the regency to a chap called Angelo. Angelo is a very strict disciplinarian and he's acting in the position of the Duke. So the Duke is then able to go back into his own dukedom if you like and watch the authority from inside to see how Ang Angelo manages and to watch what happens. As soon as this happens of course Angelo instigates a situation of very strict discipline. Um, his authority has been given to him completely by the Duke, so he's able to execute and to do, to, to pass sentence on just about everybody. And he proves that he is unworthy by judging a man uh, who has um, generated an illeg illegitimate child as being literally a lustful person and suitable for death. By the same process, when this chap's sister comes to plead for mercy, he, fall, he propositions her, proving that he's full of lust in exactly the same way. Now, this is used as an example here by Eugene and David, as the fact that, first of all, the nature of rulership has to be taken. That leadership is... is one of those things which you have to assume and then you act in the way that you're capable of to fulfill that role. And what happens then is that usually one falls short of the job. It's one of those tasks which there is no real studentship, if you like. We're going to go into something a little bit like that at first. But he's saying that this is a role, real leadership roles like this have to be assumed. You have to grasp them and then you have to live it. And that is the tutorship. Um, and this is what happens in this situation with Angelo. And he falls beneath the measure and is deposed. 
And this is what happens, generally speaking. And leadership is that a hierarchical structure which one has to climb up and climb through. He fails. There's a lovely piece here which we, did, we talked about last time with um, Isabella, um, the sister who is being propositioned by Angelo, says to him that authority, the authority, though it air like others, hath yet a kind of medicine in itself that skins the vice or the top. And Shakespeare's using a metaphor here of boiling, yeah, boiling soup so that the, um, the impurities in the soup or the impurities in anything that you're boiling to cleanse and to clear rise to the surface and they can be scooped off. So that this is what happens with human beings. You have a medicinable eye, you have a conscious eye inside of you, which if you apply it to yourself in the same way as you apply it in authority, in other words, had Angelo measured this man by the same rule that he would use to measure himself, he would have been clear, he would have been able to uh, respond adequately to the situation, but he doesn't, so he falls short of his own measure. So when we say measure for measure, which is the title of the play, which Eugene always translated as mere sure for mere sure, measuring in that sense is where you assure yourself of the rightness of, of your situation. Measuring is something that we do to give ourselves authority and confidence in any situation. <coughs> so he's assuring himself literally by acting in a way, but he hasn't had that, he hasn't been conscious enough of his own feelings and his own response in exactly the same situation that he's actually well, assessing okay. and sentencing somebody else. So he falls short of this whole measure. The Duke eventually comes back and redresses all the balances within it. It's not the only mistakes that, that Angelo makes, but it's the, it's the principal one. <coughs> right. On page 20, you were just um, coming down to, the, to this part with Angelo. The second, uh, the end of the second paragraph of it says, Assumption and pretension are, by, are the means by which we draw to us the fire we need to temper our steel. In other words, you have to make an assumption and step into a situation. That life is, is made by assumption. I remember once talking to David about um, the role of the actor. And he, he said, um, when you act in a situation, the first movement is an act. It's a show. It's a pretense in a, in a sense. If you continue to act thoroughly and completely in that role, there is no difference between the act and the reality. In that sense, you can act at anything. That you can act and become anything that you can maintain. But you have to step into the role first. You won't know you can do it until you do it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's something which a lot of us don't realize in many areas, or we may be in some, but not in others, that to, to, to gain that ability, you have to step into it. Life will then hit you hard, it will challenge you, and you may fall short, but it's the only real way to learn, to even learn what you need to do. So you act, first of all, it is a pretense, and that word pretense means you're, I think, putting attention in before you're, you're tensing the situation, you're generating the situation, which will act back against you, will hit you back. We used to talk about the idea of a bow wave. The faster you go, the faster the water hits you. At a certain point, you can't accelerate any further because the pressure of the water stops the ship. You have to redesign the shape of the ship, redesign the engine, lift it above the water to get past that bow because you, that, the world is hitting you back, it's resisting you as hard as that engine can push it. So after a while it can't go any faster. So you, you realize that designs have to be altered. you have to go back, rethink the whole situation because the world is hitting you harder than, you, than the form, the shape you have can tolerate. And this is what's happening to a king all the time. I think it was Macmillan that said, when they asked him what was the worst thing about being in office, he said, events. <laughs> Constantly got in the way from what he wanted to do. There would be an event, you know, something would happen to, him. and that's what it's all about. Right then, Shakespeare, then Shakespeare and our writers move on to another concept: the concept of Prince Hal. Uh, 